I'm Ann Hall Norris, Extension Specialist for Food Preservation and Food Safety. And I'm Elizabeth Coots, the Family and Consumer Sciences Agent in Shelby County. And through this video today, we are going to be sharing with you about canning meat. If you are a hunter or if you live with hunters, uh, you know that the freezer often is a hot commodity uh, after you have killed your game. Uh, so canning is just another option that you can preserve that meat. And when you can any kind of meat, when it's processed in the pressure canner, it cooks. So you're able to safely store that meat on room at room temperature and the meat is already cooked. So when you go to cook stew or cook a casserole, that meat, you know, you save that stuff of having to cook it. So through this video, we're going to talk about equipment. We're going to talk about precautions and safety measures uh, and research based methods so that you can safely do this at home. It's important to use a research based recipe when you're canning at home. And the USDA partnered with the University of Georgia and published this book, So Easy to Preserve. All the recipes in this book are research based, they've been tested and approved, and are safe for home canning. And the University of Kentucky uses that book as a reference. We also use the Ball Blue Book Guide to Preserving as a reference. These recipes have also been tested and approved, they're science based, and they're safe for home canning. Now don't worry if you don't have either of these books. Every extension office in Kentucky has this free publication. They have several publications on canning and this one in particular is Home Canning Meat, Poultry, Wild Game and Fish. And this is the publication Elizabeth and I are going to be using today to can our deer meat. Now before we start our demo, I'd like to talk to you about the two methods for canning. One method uses a boiling water bath canner and that's for your high acid foods. So most of your fruits and tomatoes usually fall into this category. Anything that has an acid added to it, uh, pickles, salsa, relishes, those can be safely processed in a boiling water bath canner. The temperature of a boiling water bath canner is 212 degrees. So that temperature along with the acid controls microbial growth. And when we talk about home canning, our organism of concern is Clostridium botulinum. So you have to have that acid along with that 212 degrees to control that organism. Now, if you're canning a food that doesn't have any acid, uh, a low acid food, vegetables, meat, fish, and poultry, you need a higher temperature. And you can only get that higher temperature in a pressure canner. So it's important to always use a pressure canner when you're canning your meat, fish, and poultry. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the pressure canner itself and the parts of it and, and some of the safety features of it. The first thing with your pressure canner, you want to make sure that you keep your manual for the pressure canner. This will have information on care of the pressure canner. For the most part, they're all about the same, but of course with your specific model, you want to make sure that you're going about it correctly. So keep this manual. There's also some recipes and other good information, um, like replacement of parts in that manual as well. So in your pressure canner itself, you want to make sure that you have a metal rack, and every pressure canner comes with a metal rack like this. The purpose of it is so that the jars don't sit on the bottom of the canner. So it has just a little bit of a space so they're not on that direct heat. So you have the metal rack in the bottom and then on the lid itself you will have um, a gasket underneath okay so you want to make sure that the gasket is pliable uh, that it's not dry rotted there's no cracks making sure that uh, that will seal your canner okay and then also you want to make sure that your canner is approved by the underwriters laboratory and that is a safety feature so after 1997, canners were made uh, to be a little safer. You know, we've learned some things over the years. So you just want to make sure that when you're buying a canner that it says UL approved or approved by the underwriter's laboratory. And you can look on the bottom of your canner uh, to see that that is UL approved. And of course, the canner that we're using is. So um, a couple of the other parts on the canner. So you see I have three different lids here and I have three different types of canners. So this one here is a dial gauge and then these two up here in the front are weighted gauge. The difference in them is really personal preference. The dial gauge, you can clearly see what the pressure is when you're canning. With the weighted gauge, you can hear it. 
So you may be familiar, you know, with that little jiggle and, the, and a little bit of uh, steam noise coming out. It's your personal preference which one you want to use. Today we're using the dial gauge canner. And all of these canner lids have the gasket that you can check um, underneath, that you want to check underneath. Now, if you have a dial gauge like we're using today, you want to make sure that you have it tested once a year. We recommend that you bring it to your local extension office and test that gauge. Uh, after time, they, they can become um, just a little worn. Just a little worn, yeah, and um, we just want to make sure that it's calibrated properly. Um, so we do that for free at every extension office in Kentucky, and there's one in every county if you didn't know. So make sure to have that tested. Okay, so I want to talk about a couple of the safety features um, on modern canners. One of them is the overpressure plug. It's over here on the edge. It's the same material that the gasket is made out of. So you want to check to make sure that this is pliable as well because again, over time they will wear out and they will need to be replaced. The purpose of this overpressure plug is if by chance you have your lid on and the pressure is going and you took a nap and you forgot, <laughs> the phone rings, you get distracted and you're, the pressure is just increasing and increasing and increasing. Instead of the canner exploding, uh, this little plug will pop and will release the pressure. That is much safer than uh, obviously the lid blowing off or something. Yeah, so this is an enhanced safety feature. Another safety feature is the lid lock. So if you have this lid on your pressure canner and there's any amount of pressure in the canner, the lid lock will come up and as it is its name, it locks the lid on, okay? It presses up against the bottom of the canner and, and holds the lid on. So it's really a double safety feature with these two. Um, this is just a visual indication that there is pressure inside the canner and it's not safe to open. I always, I always, that's usually the first thing that happens when you put your lid on, you turn your heat on, the pressure starts to increase, you hear the lid lock kind of jiggle and pops up and it's like, okay, good, yeah. we're good. The, the lid is locked on now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's all I want to talk about the lids, if you would set that over there. Um, I want to talk about jars now. So when you are uh, canning anything, whether it's in the pressure canner or the boiling water canner, we recommend that you use um, a name brand jar that has been made for canning. There are lots of jars on the market out there and some of them are a little lesser of quality and while those jars are still safe to use, just know that you will have more instances of the jar breaking in the canner or the lid not sealing or the lid, uh, you know, uh, unsealing at some point during storage. So we do recommend some kind of a name brand jar, um, a good quality jar, because we don't want our product only to be safe, we want it to taste good too. So those are our two most important things in canning. The canning jars have been made in a way that can be used in the pressure canner and the boiling water canner over and over and over again. So they are long lasting jars. W before you can, whether it's a new jar or a jar that you have at home, you want to check and make sure there's no cracks or scratches, especially in the rim, make sure there's no, um, you know, uh, little pieces that are broken off on the ring. So you nice can just, yeah, nice and smooth all the way around. And then we recommend that you use two-piece lids. So we have a flat metal lid that goes on the jar, and then we have a metal band. Now the flat lid is made to be used only once. So after this jar has been canned, you know, through the process, this lid has to be thrown away each time you'll use a new lid. And I always recommend and we recommend this for another reason too, but label and date right on your lid. So that's two part. So you know what it is and when you canned it, but then you also know that this lid has been used because you can reuse the lid for other things. Like I'll reuse my canned lids for dry goods on other jars, like for dehydrated foods um, or temporary storage. So I know that you know my jar of oatmeal mm -hmm. that says venison 2022 is not actually venison. Um, so you do need to use new lids every time. And then you have a metal band. So the metal band is, its purpose is just to hold the flat lid on during the canning and cooling process. So actually, once you store your food, you can remove that, that lid, the band, excuse me. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. <laughs> You also want to make sure that your band is not rusty or dented or broken in any way, but these can be reused over and over and over. 
And we have two types of jars here. Um, these are both pint sized jars, but this is a wide mouth jar and this is a regular mouth jar. And again, it's just personal preference. Uh, since we'll be canning meat today, we're going to use the wide mouth jar. It's a little bit easier to fill, um, less messy, but either one will work fine. Just make sure that when you go to buy lids each year, you know that you're getting either regular mouth or wide mouth because they are different sizes. And I will say too, it is easier, especially with meat, because it does kind of clump together and stick together when it's canned. Mm -hmm. It is easier even to dump the bead out, you know, when you're cooking out of a wide mouth jar. So a couple reasons for yeah. that. Elizabeth and I are going to be canning deer meat today, which is venison. And the first thing we're going to do is warm up our canner. So I have my instructions from the extension office right here in front of me. And the first thing you want to do is put two inches of water in the bottom of the canner. And for your reference, every quart of water will give an inch in the bottom of a canner. So I have two quarts of water. I have my rack in the bottom. I'm going to pour that water in and turn the burner on medium high so we can start warming up that canner in preparation for putting the jars in. And we don't want the water to boil yet. We, we're just warming we're it just up. Warming we're it just up. heating it up. Then the next step is to prep the meat and we're going to let Elizabeth do that. Um, she's going to cut up this um, back strap of deer. It's very lean meat. Um, you'll notice as she's cutting it up that there's very little visible fat on the meat. The recipe instructs you to slice the meat into strips or cut it into one inch cubes. And what is important is that the either the strips or the cubes are uniform in size. You don't want large chunks of meat and small chunks of meat in the same jar because as it's going through the heat process, you want uniform heat distribution inside that jar. So it's very important that the pieces are equal in size. Now, there is hardly any fat on there. There is hardly any fat. Um, there's a little bit. So I've cut a little bit of the silver skin off. Um, and one interesting thing with canning meat, any, any kind of meat, not just venison like we're doing today, but the fat will kind of solidify in the jar after it goes through the cooling process. And you can pick that fat out. So it makes it a little bit healthier, a little bit leaner by, um, by doing that. Now, if you had purchased chicken on sale or pork or maybe a beef roast and you wanted to can that and there was visible fat, you would want to trim that off because if you have excess fat in the jar, as it heats up, that fat will kind of liquefy and rise up to the top of that jar and you don't want it to get underneath the lid. It will prevent that lid from sealing properly. So if you do have visible fat, you'll want to trim that off before you pack the jars. So like Ann Hall said, I'm trying to get these pieces about consistent. You know, it can be a little hard because every, every cut of meat is um, a, a different shape. But I'm trying to get it consistent. And then I'm going to bring my jar over here. Yes, you'll notice we ha we're using a funnel. There are several pieces of equipment as we go on that will explain to you why we're using. The funnel is just to help you keep the, um, the process a little bit cleaner. You don't so much need it when you're canning meat, but if you're doing jams and jellies, it's, it's a big help. Um, salsa, anything liquid, the funnel helps make the process a little bit cleaner. And you would be surprised, though, how... Uh, when you're putting the meat in the jar, if you don't have the funnel, that it can kind of leave a little sticky residue around the rim. So like Ann Hall said, it just keeps it, keeps it a, the process a little cleaner. Also, in your instructions, we're following along um, on our UK publication. It's telling us to pack the meat into the jars tightly. It is going to shrink a little when it's cooked, so you want to pack it in tightly. It's also telling us to fill the jars not completely full. We want to leave a headspace at the top. And headspace is just the top of the product to the underside of the lid. And when you're canning meat, you want to leave a one inch head space. Our particular recipe calls for a one inch head space. You'll notice when you start canning that all of the research based recipes will give a head space for all of the products. I think we're going to have enough meat for probably three pints. We'll pack them in tightly and then we'll measure the head space. This is the tool we use to measure head space. You'll notice the stair step indentions on this uh, plastic and you'll find the one inch mark and when you go to measure you set it on the top of the jar right there on the rim and you move it around so you want the food to touch that end of the plastic while the measured end is sitting on the rim of the jar so as we fill the jars we'll 
take some from others to make sure we have a one inch head space. Head space. <laughs> so it looks like we have two full pint jars. Um, Elizabeth's been packing. I'm letting her get her hands dirty, so she's the only one that has to wash her hands. But I've measured here, the meat is touching just the bottom of that measurer. And on this one, looks like we're good. So we have a little bit extra here. Elizabeth, what are you going to do with that extra meat? Well, so I didn't even cut this extra meat up actually because I can already tell by this amount I am not going to be able to fill a third jar. So if you don't have enough, whatever you're canning, to fill the jar to the proper headspace, so in this case one inch, then that jar is not going to be safe to can. It's not going to be safe at shelf state, at room temperature. So we might put this in the refrigerator and cook it and eat it or um, actually I might, we might just cook it right now and have a little uh, venison snack. So we are only going to be canning two jars today. The other option is to uh, freeze that mm -hmm. since it was uh, fresh meat. That's right. That's right. Okay, so now that we have our jars packed, we're going to let Elizabeth wash her hands. And I, the next step, according to our instructions, are to take a damp paper towel and wipe the top rim of the jar because we don't want any food or any fat, any residue left on that jar before we put the lid on. And I like to fold a little bit of the paper towel over, just a tiny bit, to get that inside rim, especially when I'm canning meat because there's a little bit of fat that can touch that and interfere with the sealing process. Okay, so I've wiped the top rim. I'm gonna take my flat lid and place it on the jar. And then I'm gonna take my ring band and just turn it till it's fingertip tight. You don't wanna crank it down really hard because if you put the ring on too tight, that lid is stuck to the jar and no air can escape. So part of the canning process is you heat up the contents inside the jar, everything expands and the air is pushed out underneath that lid. So you don't want that lid cinched down on top of the jar. You want it just fingertip tight. You want the air to be able to escape, re be removed from the jar, and then as it cools, pull a vacuum seal. So don't crank it down tight, just fingertip tight before you put it in the canner. The recipe stated to add a half a teaspoon salt per pint jar when you're packing the meat if desired. And so adding that salt is optional, it's just for flavor. Elizabeth and I didn't add any salt today because we know we're going to be seasoning with salt or other items when we cook it to serve. So we didn't add any salt when we were packing today. Now I've got my water in here, it's heating up, it hasn't started to boil yet. It's not really hot so I can put these jars in the canner by hand. But if your water was hot, or especially when we take them out, you're gonna to wanna to use the jar lifter. And so they have um, a plastic handles on one end and the rubber coating on the other end. You use the rubber coating to grab a hold of the jar and put it in the canner. All right, now we're gonna put our lid on. And you wanna make sure when you put your lid on that you take your pressure regulator off. We want the vent port to be open so that the air can come out at this point. So on your canner lid, you'll notice a little V on the lid and a little V on the handle. You wanna line those Vs up when you set the canner lid on there so it'll drop down onto the pot nicely. And then you slide it into place. And you notice how hard it is to close that lid? That means that your gasket is in good shape, in good working condition because it is now sealed. So I'm gonna turn my heat up to high now and we're gonna start venting. We want all of that air to come out of the pressure canner. So we're gonna watch this petcock here, this port, until we see a full steady stream of steam. As it heats up, you'll see a few little spurts and sputters, uh, but we want a steady stream of steam coming out of that port before we start venting for 10 minutes. So you can see that our lid lock just now popped up. So our lid is locked on our canner for safety. And you can also see that we're just about to a full funnel of steam. We wanna make sure that the funnel of steam is consistent. It'll start to spurt and, and 
you know, it'll have a funnel, but it's not consistent. But right now, if you can see that this funnel of steam looks very consistent. So we're going to set a timer for 10 minutes and allow that loose or cool air from the canner to vent out. This step is very important to ensure that once we get to our proper pressure of 11 pounds, that the temperature of our canner is going to be about 240 to 250 degrees. And again, we can only reach that temperature in a pressure canner. Okay, so there's our timer for our 10 minutes of venting. So now we're gonna take our pressure regulator and put it over the vent port. So the purpose of that is to just keep all the steam in, keep all the air in. So the next step now is to watch our dial gauge and we're gonna wait until our pressure reaches the appropriate amount of time. And in this recipe, it is 11 pounds of pressure. And you need to make sure to read your directions if you're using a weighted gauge canner because your pressure will be different. So we're gonna watch till our pressure reaches 11 pounds of pressure. Okay, you, so you see that our pressure has now reached, um, I think it's about 10, almost 11. Um, since we want it to be at 11, at this point, I'm going to turn the heat on my stove down because that's where we want it to be. And in looking at our recipe, and I'm going to read it exactly what it says, it says to process pint jars for 75 minutes, or if you're doing quart jars, it's 90 minutes, at 11 pounds of pressure in a dial gauge pressure canner. So at this time, we are starting our timer for one hour and 15 minutes. So throughout the process of our 75 minutes, we want to regulate the heat. So I have, we're turning our burner down just a little bit at a time. So after your dial reads 11, you'll start to regulate your heat. And you want to turn it down just ever so slowly to keep your dial at 11 pounds or just a little above. If at any time during those 75 minutes, the dial goes below 11 pounds, which is indicated by our recipe, we want to turn our heat up again on our stove, get that dial back up to 11, and we're gonna start our time over. So you see why it's very important to keep that dial at or just a little bit above 11 because we don't want it to dip below because at any point in that 75 minutes that happens we'll have to get our heat back up and start over so that could potentially mean just a lesser quality of food it could it's not going to affect it too much with meat but with vegetables if that happens it could make it a little bit uh, softer and that's just not ideal it'll still be safe but just not an ideal quality so throughout the process we're going to look at the dial check our heat make sure we're not getting too high and make sure that we're not dropping below. Okay, so our timer has gone off. We have processed at 11 pounds or a little bit above for 75 minutes. So at this point, we want the canner to cool down and we want it to cool down slowly and naturally. So we aren't going to do anything other than turn the heat off and wait. And we're going to wait for a couple things to happen. To know that there's no pressure in the canner, our lid lock is going to drop. And then also the dial indicator is going to go to zero. So once those two things happen, we're going to take off our pressure regulator. Again, we want to stress the importance of letting the canner cool naturally. You don't want to take it over to the sink or put water on, cool water on it to cool it down. You don't want to blow, you know, put a fan on it or anything. We're just going to turn the heat off and let it cool down naturally. And it will take a little bit of time, um, but once we get to that point and we know there's no pressure in the canner, then we'll take the pressure regulator off. Okay, well you see our lid lock has gone down and our pressure indicated on our dial is down to zero. So we know that there is no pressure in the canner. Now the canner is still hot, but there's no pressure in the canner. Now we're going to take off the pressure regulator. And at this point, we're going to set another timer for 10 minutes. And the purpose of this waiting period is basically to help to start to cool the canner down. Okay, this is just another step in that very slow, natural cooling process. The only air that is going in and out of the canner right now is from the vent port. And that's such a tiny hole, but that's very important to, again, allow that cooling process to be very slow. So we're going to wait 10 minutes and then we'll remove our lid. Our 10 minute timer just went off and so I think it's safe to slide the lid back. The arrows say to go this way. I'm going to twist it. There's still steam inside the canner. It's warm. I'm going to lift it away from me so that I don't get all of that steam in my face. 
It's still very hot, actually. It is. <laughs> so be very careful. You, I don't know if you can see there's steam coming up out of here. And once Anna Hall takes out the jars, you can see that they're still bubbling. They're still cooking. I am using the jar lifter because they're very hot. And you can see that the contents are still boiling inside the jar. We're going to lift them out straight up and straight down. You don't want to tilt them. You don't want to take a chance on getting any liquid that's inside the jar underneath that lid because it still hasn't sealed. So we're going to take them out of the canner. I heard a pop. I did. <laughs> and let them sit undisturbed for the next 12 to 24 hours and let that um, cool down naturally and let that vacuum seal go ahead and form. We just heard a jar pop. We might hear one in a minute. Um, there's a little bit of water on the top of those lids. Just let that evaporate as it dries um, before you write on it because the next step after the seal forms is to, to check them after 12 to 24 hours. Once they're sealed, you won't hear that popping and then you can write on them uh, the product and the date that they were made. And then how long are we going to keep them? So if properly canned, you know, home canned foods will last for quite a long time. Um, we recommend that you eat what you've canned in about a year, and that's gonna be for the best quality and the best nutrition content. Um, but two years and even beyond, you know, if they're safely canned and processed, they, they will last. But one year is the ideal time to consume what you've home canned. And this has been cooked. It's ready to eat right out of the jar. But an additional step for safety reasons is to heat that up, maybe bring it to a boil and cook for 10 minutes before you consume it. And with our cubed venison that we made today, chances are we're going to cook this in a stew or some kind of a soup. So it would be easy to heat it up and boil it in that stew or in that soup. So if you would like any more information about canning meat or canning anything for that matter, you can contact your local county extension office to get more information.